Okay, welcome everybody to tonight's uh, event. We have a hybrid event tonight, so we also have folks joining online, so thank you for those of you online as well. Uh, we look forward to a fun discussion tonight. Uh, my name is Tony Rotava, and I'm serving this season as a co-chair of EEF and one of the volunteer board members with the organization, and uh, happy to be hosting you guys here tonight. Uh, so a little bit about VEF. Uh, VEF is Vancouver Entrepreneurs Forum. It's a non-profit society and uh, Vancouver's premier networking forum for technology entrepreneurs. Founded in 1988, VEF has been bringing together entrepreneurs and investors alike to cultivate meaningful connections and create conversations designed to stimulate ideas. And we host eight, ev eight events per calendar year with our kickoff each September. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, UBC Robson Square is situated on traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. And so it's our privilege to work and play on this land today. Okay, uh, and just like really quickly, I, I'm with Pender Ventures, which is a, a venture capital firm investing in B2B software companies with a, a healthcare focus. And we're located here in Vancouver locally. Uh, so just some housekeeping slides, or one housekeeping slide. Have your ringers off, but uh, log into Slido to ask questions to the panel at any time. We'll have a Q&A probably around 6.30 or whenever Will finds the appropriate time, and, but let the uh, questions flow and vote which, whichever question you want to get prioritized. And use hashtag VEF on Slido. And so I'd like to also acknowledge uh, VEF sponsors. And this slide here has uh, the various VEF sponsors. A uh, particular thank you to TELUS, uh, which is our, uh, TELUS Ventures, which is our presenting sponsor this season. And other sponsors as well to thank are CIBC, Douglas College, Corporate Recruiters, Faskin, Silicon Valley Bank, Vantage Capital, uh, Entrepreneurship at UBC, and uh, thanks to our media sponsor, Vancouver Tech Journal, and our delivery partner, New Ventures BC. And thanks to the volunteers who have put on this event tonight as well, help put on the event. So tonight's uh, discussion is uh, blockchain, the technology most likely to change the world, moderated by William Johnson uh, from the Vancouver Tech Journal. And at the end of the discussion, of course, we have Q&A, so hashtag VEF to ask your questions. And then following Q&A, join us for a drink and some networking. And uh, let's get started. So tonight we have uh, our typical lightning pitches. We have five of them, four in person and one virtual. And the format is 100 seconds, uh, which I subjectively time. And uh, we'll start with, uh, actually first I'll start with a community announcement from Chang Lu of UBC Blockchain Cluster. Welcome, Chang. Uh, hello everyone, thank you for uh, coming to this event and thank you for, uh, and thank the, thanks to the organizer for uh, inviting me. So my name is Chang Lu and uh, I work with Professor Victoria Lemieux at Blockchain BC. And Professor Lemieux is going to uh, speak very soon later in this event. So the announcement that I'm going to make today is that uh, the team at the Blockchain UBC and a few industry partners are trying to uh, commercialize a decentralized health data exchange that we developed in a lab. So the goal of the exchange is to enable individuals like you and me to uh, share our health information with pharmaceutical companies, research institutions, and insurance companies. And the information that we share could be diagnostic information from the lab or uh, information from our wearables like Fitbit or uh, genomics data and biomarkers. And when we share the information with the third parties that I just mentioned, uh, we will be compensated with cash and a native token. And then uh, we can use the cash and native token to engage in more health activities and uh, generate more health data and feed the data back into the ecosystem. So um, uh, we believe that this exchange would have benefits for uh, different actors. So for the pharmaceutical companies and the research institutions, you know, they will have more data, uh, and uh, when they have more data, they will be able to generate a more effective therapy, therapies and drugs. And then for individuals, this is going to be a way for you to earn passive income, and also uh, you will be incentivized to uh, get healthy. 
And uh, in the past three years, we have uh, developed the technology, uh, the foundational layer of technology, and also we have validated the market. Uh, so right now, we are in the process of looking for uh, funding partners and ecosystem partners. So if you are interested in the idea, uh, please feel free to uh, talk to me uh, or, prof or Professor Victoria Lemieux uh, at the end of this event. We would love to uh, tell you more about this project. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Chang. Uh, now we have the uh, lightning pitches. Our first lightning pitch is uh, Emika from Block a Day. Welcome, Emika. Let's do it. Um, um, let's start. I can start right now, right? Yeah, you can just click the slide. OK. So hello, everyone. I'm Emika, a co-founder of Block a Day where are we trying to add a block of knowledge every day? So here is a lot of like blockchain use cases in, in the industry. I believe that everyone here heard a lot of news, uh, a lot of like technical terms like NFT, DAO, DeFi. Some of people here trade cryptos and some, some business owners try to incorporate like blockchain as part of your businesses. Um, at Blockaday, we believe that blockchain technology have a lot of potential to empower billions of lives. However, more and more builders in the space trying to build product and service on various blockchain. Unfortunately, not so many people know enough about it or know how to use those products. This is not a good thing for builders, right? So at Blockaday, we're trying to help builders to solve this problem by educate and onboard users to use that platform. So what are we building? The current blockchain education right now, lack of like user retention, personalization, engagement, and um, cohesion. So what are we trying to build is we help Web3 company to educate, to educate and onboard users, and at the same time, we build learn to earn platform uh, where we create tasks, learning modules, and on-chain uh, um, on-chain analysis. So once people learn the modules, they complete the task, and they can actually earn the reward and at the same time on-chain credentials. So right now we are clearly working with the Web3 companies. Right now we are at the state that we work with client, but in the future we are going to have decentralized content platform where we are going to open for creators to come create and host uh, their content on Blockaday. Yeah, so starting in February, we have host over six events, partnered with university clubs, and then um, we just won the third place from RBC Guest Seated Pitch at UBC, and right now working with two pilot projects with two plate clients. Here's the goal of a block a day. So we are trying to launch our first version of a Learn to Earn platform within the end of summer, and we are going to like onboard more people and work with more clients. To achieve the goal, we, uh, we keep going out and like trying to network with people in Canada and overseas. And here is our team. We are a team of five people uh, who bring with us the passion to empower people and get people ready for opportunity in blockchain space. We are clearly looking for funding to use in product development, uh, content creation, and marketing. So if you are interested, Please feel free to reach out to me after the event. With your support, um, builders can focus on building, and we are helping them to educate and bring users to their platform. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Emika. And our second lightning pitch uh, is uh, John from Ineco. Welcome, John. Press the button. For 100 seconds, I don't need slides. Sure. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm John Ricci. I'm the CFO at Ineco Systems, and we're a cybersecurity software company based in Burnaby. And historically, we've worked with uh, banks, payment processors, national payment switches, retailers to map out the entire payment journey uh, into a single unified transaction. And we use that uh, that one transaction to analyze, detect, and prevent payment fraud. 
um, before the transaction actually completes. So our customers include Moneris, Discover Cards, American Express, uh, as well as other global FI brands. Uh, we use machine learning um, models for every card and every customer for a more refined risk, uh, fraud risk assessment, uh, reduce false positives, as well as ultimately improve the customer experience. We are now launching iNetco Crypto, uh, which takes our existing fraud detection and blocking solution and brings this to the benefit of the crypto space. Uh, whether it's payment fraud, insider fraud, ad uh, advanced persistent threats, DDoS attacks, or sophisticated zero day uh, attacks, we're able to identify and block those uh, attacks before they actually uh, create significant financial loss and ultimately customer heartache. Uh, from our discussions with our banking customers, uh, they are all considering moving into crypto, but there's significant hesitation uh, with this due to the perceived complexity, uh, fraud risk, as well as regulatory risk uh, with launching a crypto offering. Um, Ineco Crypto is designed to address these concerns, and we deploy uh, the latest in regards to behavioral modeling, uh, machine learning, fraud detection, uh, and security to the crypto space to give FIs and the end customer the same peace of mind uh, that their crypto accounts are as safe as their fiat accounts. We're in the process of doing a raise. Uh, would love to explore more if you guys are interested. Uh, feel free to reach out to me afterwards. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. And our third lightning pitch is Diego Rios from Wary. Oh, so no, sorry, it's Jason Coles. Welcome, Jason, from NFT Technologies. All right, NFT tech in 100 seconds. So first, I want to start with kind of our view on NFTs, you know, not simple JPEGs and artwork. Um, you know, we think even the biggest things are changing. You're seeing the board apes already moving to gamified utility, and you're seeing NFTs already using a ton of different sectors. You're seeing gaming, entertainment, sports, KYC, identity, and even carbon credits as of recently. Um, so here, quick highlight of the business, you know, our top tier kind of platform, we're working with tier one brands to launch unique NFT campaigns. You know, the cool thing, resale royalties, being able to monetize someone else's brand and build tech for them in Web3 while owning a piece of their brand is extremely interesting for us. Uh, we did a first of its kind data NFT for the Australian Open. Quick highlight of it, split a tennis court into 6,000 squares, each square represented by a tennis ball. During the actual tournament, if someone hit your square, they won the, they won the of the set, they won the point, they won the match, they won the tournament, your ball would actually change colors. So first one of its kind. Uh, quick team highlights, myself, Jason, did 200 ICOs during the crazy boom, some of which is on Binance today. Uh, Wayne Lloyd did a bunch of stuff, kind of M&A world as well for Hive. Adam Decada is the current head of partnerships at Decentraland, and he was the ex-head of IP for Harry Potter. Jeremy Gardner was, did the first Ethereum ICO called Augur. And then Mario ran one of the biggest ICO consulting companies. Um, so kind of other parts of the business. Yes, we have an NFT portfolio, all the JPEGs that I talk shit about. And then we're doing a bunch of kind of game, game five, play to earn stuff, as well as building a bunch of technology for some of the biggest exchanges and other companies out there. So there you go. We're public on the NEO in a week and one day. We have the ticker NFT. So thanks again. Thanks, Jason. And uh, here now we have um, uh, Diego Rios from Wary. Hi, my name is Diego, um, uh, and I'm building a platform as a new way to distribute wearables in online games and the metaverse. Uh, I'm originally from Guatemala, and in Guatemala we have these cool masks that are. Uh, on, on carved on wood, and about three, four months ago, I turned those into design and tried to sell them as wearables in online games in the metaverse. But I quickly realized how difficult it is. With each platform having its own rules, tokens, uh, design formats, it became almost impossible. And I also realized that brands are struggling with the same things. Creators are facing the same challenges of not being able to know how to distribute and sell wearables into online games um, in, in, in the metaverse. And surprisingly, it's a huge market. Just last year, there were $20 billion in sales in, non in wearables and online games, and then that market is expected to grow to $65 billion without taking the metaverse into account. 
Um, and that's exactly why I created Vary. Vary is a platform to help brands and creators distribute and sell wearables into online games and the metaverse. Uh, I want to help, we want to help bridge the gap between brands and consumers so that they can upload designs, regardless whether they're in athletics, in sports, in luxury, and distribute those designs into different marketplaces in online games and metaverse. We want to make the process simple. We want to take the complexity away. Um, and we want to help brands unify all that commerce into one platform and be able to do everything through one place. Uh, we're currently building our MVP to test it with a bunch of brands. Uh, my background is in product marketing. I used to run the, the global go-to-market strategy for e-commerce and conversational commerce for MessageBird. Um, and if you are a developer looking for new exciting opportunities, if you're also an angel investor at VC who invests in early stage uh, startups, or if you're a brand or a creator looking to sell wearables in online games in the metaverse, feel free to reach out. And you can also find me at Diego Rios or The Mustache. Thanks. Hey, thank you, Diego. And our final lightning pitch is uh, a virtual pitch from Jason at Quandry coming up right now. Hi, my name is Jackson. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Quandry. Quandry deploys and manages digital workers to automate the time-consuming and manual work that people just shouldn't be doing. Starting with the insurance industry, or building a platform where customers can buy off-the-shelf digital workers and deploy them into their software systems to save their team countless hours of manual work. One of our digital workers automates the renewal revision process, essentially comparing two policies before they renew. This bot alone can redeploy anywhere from two to 10 full-time staff depending on the size of the brokerage, for a third of the price. Customers pay us on a subscription basis, with an average subscription being in the 1K to 1.5K per month. Along with my brother, Jameson, we've bootstrapped this business to 15 customers, 275K ARR, and a team of four engineers and one product manager, in addition to Jameson and myself. The insurance market is a $14 billion market for us in North America, and we plan on using the insurance industry as a beachhead into the broader financial services market which is worth 70 billion for us. Our main competitive advantage is that we're going completely vertical on insurance and productizing our bots, which other competitors aren't doing. We believe this will allow us to scale faster, at which point we can move into other verticals aggressively to gain market share. We're currently raising 1 million on a safe with a valuation cap of 10 million. We have 400K already committed from angel investors and are aiming to have the round closed by June 10th. This money will be used primarily for hiring with a focus on engineering and sales. This will allow us to integrate our existing products into all major systems in the industry, which opens up more of the market for us and will enable us to achieve our goal of 250 customers by the end of 2023. Thank you and look forward to meeting with you. Okay, thank you to the lightning pitches and community announcement. That was great. Thanks for joining us tonight. And uh, now on to the main event, and I'll ask the panelists to please come take a seat. Uh, and then while they're doing that, I'll just give a couple comments about it. So tonight's topic is exploring blockchain and how it's poised to transform different industries, redefining the ways in which we tra transact online, share ideas, and manage our data and workflows. Beyond what we might understand is the new digital currency for payments and NFT marketplaces. Blockchain, of course, is being used for so much more. In this session, uh, we're going to go through the, some fundamentals of blockchain and some applications that are profoundly transforming businesses, governments, and even society, and uh, setting the next stage for uh, next generation of value-driven uh, internet. So Will Johnson uh, and panel, take it away. Thanks so much, Tony. Um, good to see everyone. Um, assuming the audio works fine, um, great to have our panelists up here. I think the first thing in the script is that I'm supposed to remind everyone that if you have questions this evening, go to slido.com, and the code that you put in is just VEF. That's how you can get your questions into the queue for the Q&A portion of this evening. Um, welcome to our panelists. Um, we have Wilkin Chung at Manifold. The order is wrong, but so I'll just look at you guys. <laughs> Welcome to Shung at Manifold. We've got uh, Nico Christofi at Signalytic, and then uh, Victoria Lemieux um, with uh, Blockchain at UBC. I believe you're the cluster lead for Blockchain at UBC. Uh, we're really lucky. Uh, earlier today, before um, we got here, I was sent sort of a summary of what attendees said they wanted to know tonight. 
And the most interesting thing that I saw was that the majority of people that filled out the form basically just said, I want to understand blockchain. So I feel like that means for a lot of people, um, they're still wrapping their head around the concepts of blockchain, what it is, uh, why does it matter. For example, I talked to my mother the other day, and I asked her if she knew what blockchain was. And it wasn't that she didn't know what it was, it's that she wasn't sure why she should even care. So I feel like a lot of people are, are still there. So hopefully tonight we can answer questions about why blockchain matters, and we'll answer the question that is in the title, which is, is blockchain the technology most likely to change the world? So to get us started, um, I'm going to have each of our panelists talk about what you're working on right now. I'm curious, personally, how did you get into blockchain? What attracted you to the space? And then what do you think the unique perspective is that you, you bring to the space and to the conversation this evening? So what are you working on now? So your company, what does it do? How did you get into blockchain? And then what's the perspective you bring? What's the lens that you're bringing to the conversation? Uh, Wilkins, how about, we, how about you kick it off? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so I'm part of Manifold. Um, we provide tooling that allows for creative sovereignty in the NFT ecosystem. So actually, I, I've been involved in the blockchain space for almost a decade now. Um, the first, actually one of the first products I ended up building or, or tried to build was actually a blockchain, uh, a Bitcoin bank. and we tried to do that like legitimately with banking licenses and stuff like that, and it was like super hard. This is back in like 2014, and kind of gave up on that. And, and through that experience, I realized that the interesting thing about blockchain wasn't the financial aspect to me, but it was about how it could be used for consumer technology. You know, fast forward to late 2020, uh, NFTs kind of came on the scene. You know, being a gamer, I actually had a gaming company that I exited back in 2020. Um, the concept of digital ownership made a lot of sense to me. Uh, any gamers here probably understand, you know, like owning digital assets is, just makes sense, right? Like we own songs, we own music, we own digital assets. So the concept of NFTs just was a natural uh, transition for me for a consumer product. So I actually got in the space primarily uh, as a collector initially. I, I bought a lot of stuff. I built uh, an analytics platform to try and understand what was going on in the space. And through that process, connected with a number of different creators. And what I found was that the creators themselves didn't even understand what blockchain technology was. They, they thought they were just minting these JPEGs and videos, these, these digital assets. They didn't understand what the power of NFTs were. And what it was, was it provided them with a direct connection to their community and their fans. So what I like to, uh, one of the stories I like to tell is prior to blockchain, all these creators created content and they shared it on Facebook and Instagram. And the people who extracted value every time they shared the content was Facebook and Instagram. These guys made no money, right? Um, when NFTs came along, they're like, okay, well, let's, let's create these NFTs. These collectors would, would buy these NFTs, and now they have a direct relationship. These collectors kind of viewed uh, the fact that if this artist became more popular, their NFTs would become more valuable. And they acted almost like as an amplifier for these creators. In turn, these creators wanted to provide more and more value for these collectors. So you create this interesting social, almost mini social network that's owned by the creator and visible to everybody else. You know, once that started happening, once we started engaging with some of these creators, if anybody remembers the NFT space back in 2020, early 2021, everybody was still minting off of these, you know, single uh, shared smart contracts. And if anybody knows anything about smart contracts, it's like, it's almost like uh, a decentralized network centralizing again, right? Everybody was trying to mint off of like contracts controlled by OpenSea and Foundation, et cetera, et cetera. So, so uh, quickly, does anyone want Wilkins to talk about what a smart contract is? Or does everyone get that? I just want to see where we are in the room. Okay. No one has. Everyone knows what that is, I guess. Most people know. I can kind of look oh, back. Oh, no, there's a hand. Okay. A smart contract. <laughs> okay. An NFT. An NFT is comprised of two main components. A smart contract, which keeps track of, like, the ownership and, like, defines uh, what the NFT represents. And then a token identifier. So... Prior, like the, the prior state of the art was in 2020, uh, early 2020, everybody was using like OpenSea's uh, uh, shared smart contract. Everybody's minting off the same shared contract. And the problem with that is you don't really control that data. OpenSea controls the data, right? Um, our whole big thing was once we started engaging with these artists, they realized the value of what it meant to control your own smart contract. You control your own inventory. You control your audience. You control what you can create. You're not dictated what you can do by a platform. So that's when we decided to start a company around 
ensuring that creative sovereignty exists, uh, creating a number of tools and infrastructure that allows creators to essentially become their own platform and uh, kind of push that technology space forward. So that's kind of what we're, we're about. Um, a bit long-winded, but you know, that's a bit of the context. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Wilkins. Nico. Um, my background is in clinical medicine, and uh, my experience uh, before Signalytic and also that of my co-founders of Signalytic um, uh, was in Eastern Africa, very, very rural parts, um, and uh, just witnessing a senseless loss of life and human capital whenever like a woman, let's say, is giving birth in front of you. Um, she's having what's called a postpartum hemorrhage, which is might be bleeding after birth, which is very normal to happen. Uh, in Canada, we have very easy ways of, of dealing with that most of the time. Um, and uh, what we witnessed many times was that there was a lack of a 35 cent drug um, and people only had paper-based ways to, to manage their own drug inventory. Um, so then uh, uh, they had to go into these crazy um, uh, searches to, that routinely take about six hours from the moment you realize you need a drug until you're able to get that drug back. And that's called a stock out. The moment you acutely need a drug and you don't have it, it's called, they call it stock outs there. Um, that was actually a, a big reason why doctors left their, um, their work in Uganda, where I was at the time. Um, and we really uh, decided that we had to understand why this was happening and whether we wanted to start a technology or whether we wanted to start a program or an NGO or whatever. We didn't know, we just really needed to understand what that was. Um, and what, was, what we found is that people really needed to communicate their data between each other, um, but where they were, they, the facilities didn't have electricity, uh, they didn't have connectivity, uh, like internet connectivity, so they weren't able to use the, the conventional technologies that we had. So many times, they, maybe they had a laptop that was able to work with intermittent power, but whenever they were trying to get data from some sort of central server, um, they were getting a connection error and they were getting all these failures and they weren't able to use something reliably. And when you're not able to use something reliably in those very high tension moments, uh, you revert to um, doing what you know and that might be um, uh, a, a, a wide variety of things. So we, we actually really resisted blockchain. Uh, we really did not want to start a blockchain company because it was 2018. Everyone was talking about blockchain at the time and we really didn't want to kind of detract from the point of what we're doing but for us, actually, blockchain um, in the beginning was just a way to have decentralized data. So it, we started this, a distributed ledger, which is um, um, like the, the, the grandparent of blockchains, maybe, or, or I don't know how to necessarily define that. So um, what we, the reason we started the distributed ledger was because if you have a node at every single health facility that currently holds the data of the whole network, people were able to query their local node, they didn't have to connect to the internet or anything, and see who has drugs when. And they were able to just like do that um, reliably, and that's why we started on blockchain, and then uh, in a quest to kind of make sure we do have some like actual sustainability and we're not gonna be dependent on international development agencies funding us on five-year cycles, et cetera, et cetera, um, we started building also our own version of smart contracts um, where we were able to start um, uh, proposing to insurance companies or to governments to be able to say that now that they have all this data that's outside of the cities and like 90% of East Africa, which is not currently connected, we're now providing this new data. And now instead of paying for things up front, um, the smart contract says that they will only actually um, pay for something once we know that that action has been happened. So we're, we're able to use um, uh, data that we're collecting that has not been able to be collected yet uh, or up until this moment um, to be able to say like if a patient does come to a health facility, uh, if a patient then does get diagnosed with something and then goes um, to a, a, a private pharmacy to get their drug, once all that is completed, then they're able to get a payment and that payment happens on time and it happens reliably, et cetera, et cetera. So we kind of came much more from the functional standpoint and we were, our, our hand was forced, the only option we really had was to go with the blockchain. Yeah, fantastic, Nico, and uh, Victoria. Yeah, well, really fascinating stories, guys. Um, so my background is archival science. I'm trained as an archivist, uh, which is all about record keeping. Uh, I was gonna say, make sure you hold it close. I think close. the folks online who are watching need, need us to talk into the mics. Okay. I was told that. You can hear me. All right. Um, so that's traditional record keeping. And um, how I got into this space is about 2015, I was reading a story in the Financial Times about how the government of Honduras was planning to put all of its land records on blockchain. 
And um, my background being in archival science, I said, well, this is about record keeping. This is something I have to learn about. So I, I started to, to learn about it. And um, quite honestly, I was horrified <laughs> initially when I started to dig into this particular project by uh, a company that no longer exists, um, but at the time, Factum. Um, and the reason I was horrified is because the solution really overlooked basic archival theory and record keeping. And I said, you know, um, this is, this is really interesting. They're, they're just going to put all these records on a blockchain. They're not going to worry about whether they're accurate in the first place, whether that's reliably done, whether we can really authenticate these records. But I said to myself, you know, I don't think this solution is it, but I think blo there's something about blockchain. And uh, it's something that blockchain gives us that we've lost in the era of big data. Because in the era, era of big data, what we have is a lot of capabilities that we've developed through artificial intelligence, for example, to manipulate data. So we see how you know, we can do amazing things to, to take you know, what used to be static records and um, reassemble them into, to, to, to learn new things through artificial intelligence. Uh, but that also has created an age in which we've got deep fakes and we've got a lot of ma manipulation of data. So we've lost that kind of immutability, but blockchain gave us that back. And so we could then generate trust in record keeping again, which I felt we had lost and I saw real potential there. And, and just you know, to, to speak to like, why is that important? Um, record keeping is extremely important for all of humanity because uh, basically it's, it's one of the key ways that we reduce the risk of transacting with, the, with, with one another, uh, another. Because if I'm entering into a, a relationship with you, I don't really know about you, unless of course we're in the same community and I have like a long standing relationship. But typically in a complex society like you know, our own, we have to transact with people we don't know. And there's an advantage in doing that. We can do more complex transactions. Um, but the way that we start to you know, know that we can place trust in each other is often through things like contracts, which are records, right? And we know there's these, these ways that we can trust these records to kind of hold each other accountable and make sure that we behave in a way that is in each other's interests. So um, the Nobel Prize winning economist Kenneth Arrow said, you know, there's a lot of transaction fr friction where we don't have trust. And what record, keep, uh, record keeping, that is trusted record keeping gives us is trust. And that makes a society more efficient and capable of doing more things like, you know, complex incentive, um, complex coordinated action like um, reducing carbon emissions that require a lot of trust and, and coordination. We can do that with blockchain because we have this trust architecture. So that's really what got me interested. I then came back to UBC. I, I happened to be on leave for a little bit at the World Bank at that time. I came back to UBC. I said, oh, well, I want to learn more about this. So I got, got together with a bunch of students who were also interested in learning more about this because I don't like to learn by myself. I like to you know, just learn with everybody else. It's more fun that way. And we just started our first summer institute and found a blockchain at UBC. And it's now growing. Um, Coindesk named us number one in Canada this year for blockchain education. And we're number 28 globally, which is not bad. UBC is ranked 42 overall, so we're punching above our weight. Um, so I'm really pr proud of, of what we've been able to achieve as a multidisciplinary research and education cluster. So um, what am I doing personally? OK, my area of research is looking at records management in healthcare. So um, Chang spoke about that project. I'm also working with another one of our industry partners, Peer Social Foundation, on how do you capture and preserve evidence of war crimes? And I can, you can imagine which you know, jurisdiction that's most relevant in right now, although we started last summer when we were looking at other jurisdictions. And then finally, I'm looking at indigenous identity and um, how you can achieve indigenous self-sovereignty through data self-sovereignty using blockchain technology. So those are my three main projects right now, all of which are applying archival science principles to the design of this, this uh, technology.
Great, thanks so much, Victoria. Um, so I might repeat some stuff, just because again, I really want to hammer home like the basics and make sure everyone here understands. So, I mean, you were talking a little bit about uh, records management and trust. I think you were talking about having access to, I mean, critical health information that ultimately saves lives. You were talking about um, artist sovereignty, having artists basically um, get the benefits of their art, right, and have the value accrue back to artists. Um, what are some of the other you know, real problems that blockchain has the potential to solve. I mean, you can expand on what you're already working on, but again, for folks here, there's folks in the audience I know that work in, again, healthcare, accounting, there's folks in the audience that I've talked to that work in real estate. Um, can you guys, or are you guys able to articulate, again, some of the real problems that blockchain solves, and again, really hammer home why people should really, really care? Go, go ahead, Wilkins. Well, I can talk about, like, from a from a techno like a, a technical standpoint, uh, if you look at the raw technical aspect of a blockchain, it's it's a ledger. It's an immutable ledger. Uh, it's a pen only record of of actions that happen. Right? Doesn't sound too exciting. Honestly, it's a very if you if you look at it purely from a technical standpoint, it's actually a very inefficient way to do things. Right? The power of the blockchain comes because it provides a common interface for everybody else to participate in that data set in that in that network. I don't think you can kind of decouple a blockchain and the success of a blockchain from the incent, um, the incent mechanics around participating in that blockchain. So for example, like Ethereum works because you know, the miners get rewards, the people who participate in the ecosystem um, you know, have to pay gas to participate in the ecosystem, but all the data on chain can be consumed by everybody else. It, it, it provides a really easy, common and trusted interface for everybody to consume that data. Uh, one of the other blockchains that, that is very fascinating to me is Arweave. If anybody knows what Arweave is, it, it's effectively a decentralized uh, file storage system, right? Uh, the way that network works is that if you provide storage resources and you store data, you earn AR token, right? If you store data, you have to pay AR token. It's really interesting because the, the, the alternative to that is a company like Dropbox. They accrue and, and build all those resources as a single entity. They earn all the revenue and they redistribute that revenue to es essentially acquire more, more storage resources. But this decentralized network, anybody can contribute in a free market more storage, more storage resources. And I think that's what's really fascinating. It, it's providing a common interface for people to participate in the ecosystem and the economy. So I think that's a really interesting answer because, well, because you talked about two different blockchains, which again is another thing that I feel like you guys need to dive into, which is that there isn't one blockchain. There are different blockchains and different blockchains are optimized for different purposes. Um, Victoria, I'm curious on, on your take, and again, well, because you can jump in here in terms of like, people here are thinking about, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, side chains. Um, what are some of the things that people need to ask themselves before they build on top of any given blockchain? And then, Nico, I know that for, in your case, you guys built your own blockchain. And so perhaps, uh, again, once Victoria's answered, uh, you can dive into like why you had to do that, right, specifically. So go, go ahead, Victoria. Yeah. So uh, it's true, there's, there's lots of different blockchains. Um, what they all have in common, though, is a ledger. So, uh, you know, first of all, I think you have to understand, okay, what kind of ledger is it? Is it a big, open, public, permissionless ledger, meaning can everybody um, participate in creating the ledger and, and um, recording transactions on that ledger, uh, come and go as they please, that meaning permissionless? Um, it, does it operate uh, with, you know, complete transparency, sort of like Bitcoin and Ethereum? So that's, you know, that's one type of ledger. Uh, but in not all use cases are really appropriate to that. So in some of the medical um, and healthcare type situations, you, you don't necessarily want, you know, actors to come and go. You want to create a sort of more traditional trust model, and so you have blockchains that are private and permissioned, and those ones um, don't uh, have the, you know, the, the kind of consensus mechanisms necessarily that the big public permissionless blockchains have because they're relying on identity to be able to, to create some, some other layer of trust. So 
you can have uh, different trust models for these blockchains, and you have to think through what one makes most sense for your particular use case. And you know, things like, how much transparency do I need? Um, also, some of these blockchains have native tokens, and some of them are tokenless. So, for example, Hyperledger Fabric, it doesn't have a, a native token. But if you are using, for example, the blockchain for strictly for communications, well, then, you, you, know, you know, it's more or less internal. Let's say it's emergency services or something like that. Well, you don't necessarily need a token. But if you're using it for payments or for buying and selling assets, for example, like NFTs, well, then, yes, you want a native token. Uh, it's also the token is a very important aspect of, in some cases, in, you know, getting in, in, people to cooperate and incentivizing them to behave in certain ways. So you might need that tokenomics, as it's, it's called, to actually make actors you know, behave a, in a trustworthy fashion. So these are the kinds of things. There's all kinds of things you have to think through. But at the end of the day, you know, what I really start from is, what is the social trust problem we're trying to solve here? Like, where's the friction at the end of the day that we're trying to, to solve? Um, a lot of, you know, for example, record keeping in supply chain is done and creates all kinds of paperwork and slows down the whole process because the actors don't necessarily trust each other. You know, they don't know, well, have you shipped that to me? How do I know you shipped that to me before I pay you? These are things that can be solved with blockchain um, by having this shared ledger and by using the, what I, what, well, I haven't called it necessarily, but, but I'm borrowing other people's language, um, trustless trust. That's the, the crypto economics or the tokenomics piece of it that um, people call it trustless trust because they're using the token to incentivize people to behave in a certain way. And the token, it operates through the, the coded algorithms that are you know, encoded as the consensus mechanisms in these blockchains. That's why it's called trustless trust. So you have to really think things through. And, um, oh, well, there's other things like strategy. How well developed is the technical stack? And, you know, um, you know is the team good? Is the crypto good? Uh, there's just so many things that you have to think through. So it's not an easy decision. So I'm interested in why you guys decided you wanted to build your own. Uh, Nico, quickly, I just wonder, Wilkins, do you have anything to add to that before we go to Nico, just based on, again, your experience with artists or NFTs? I mean, uh, another, I mean, another aspect of it is, like, if you, if you do have consumers of the technology that you're trying to build, you know, depending on the technology that you're trying to build, it's, where's the audience right now, right? Like, it's, it's you know, if you're building a DeFi product, right, um, you know, you're probably going to choose something with a lot of DeFi activity. It makes no sense for you not to, right? If you're building a NFT product, you want to take a look at who your audience for that product is. Like, are they are they high value NFTs? Are they lower value with high high volume? And and where is the audience currently for that, that stuff? So I think it's really, you know, taking a look at your product and where you anticipate your your consumers to be. And there are chains that are geared better towards certain products right now. No, fantastic. I mean, to me, it sounds like it's quite complicated, and maybe the best thing for regular people to do is to go to an expert or a consultant or, like, where, where do people uh, go? I don't think that's super necessary, right? It's like, if you're building a DeFi product, it's probably, probably you're probably use ETH or an L2, right? Uh, that's where everybody's trading, right? Um, it, take a look at what successful products are out there and, and, and see what the market volume looks like, I guess, for, for a consumer product, at least. So you said, you said L2, layer two, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that in a bit. But um, uh, Nico, again, you guys looked at all the blockchains out there and you said, actually, we need to make our own. Um, so take us through that journey. So um, back in 2018, uh, the most famous, from my very layman perspective, the most famous uh, blockchain was a Bitcoin blockchain. And at that time, the, uh, you know, Bitcoin blockchain needs a lot of energy resources as far as electricity goes, and it needs a lot of high-speed connectivity for nodes to be speaking to each other for us to maintain um, a, a proper um, agreed-upon ledger. Um, 
And we were working in places that did not have a lot of electricity and places that did not, uh, were not online most of the time. Uh, so we had to really figure out uh, how we were still able to keep a consensus of what the truth is out there uh, with nodes that are not always communicating with each other. Um, we were lucky to be able to uh, go make a private blockchain because uh, that really reduced a lot of the need um, for the, the energy intensity that we see in a lot of, of blockchains that are not private. Um, so we were able to kind of use proof of identity to be able to, to um, allow actors on, the, on, the, on, on our distributed ledger. Um, and then the really complicated part comes when you have two nodes that are trying to write to a common ledger uh, that are not connected at the same amount of, at the same time, but they're both writing onto a ledger at, um, at the same time, at world time, but not same network time. Uh, so uh, that's where a lot of the, the algorithms came in uh, with our CTO, who we were very lucky to, to bring on, who kind of thinks in these exact kind of ways. Um, so um, we had to just build this, this custom ledger that was able to work in that way and then use um, external validators to make sure that what we were doing was um, legitimate and was going to, to withstand scale. Um, so that's how we did that. I, I, I would just like to say maybe back on one of the things that you were talking about as far as like what are real world applications or uh, something like that you were asking, something similar to that. Um, and something that we were just talking about right before as far as like where, where can it help or like what, what are some real problems it can solve. Yeah, what are the real problems that blockchain solves? Yeah, yeah I'm not going to answer that question, but I'm going to say a story that came to mind, um, which was something that I brought up, I think, when we were talking earlier. Um, when I have this great party trick whenever I'm standing in front of people in Uganda. Mostly Uganda is where we work. And it's usually like a bunch of doctors around a table and we're talking about how something works or whatever. And um, whenever I try to, to bring up the importance of the data that they're creating and putting on here, um, I, I always ask the people, like, who here has Facebook? And Facebook is widely used um, there. Um, and uh, everyone raises their hand, and, and then I ask, so who here pays for Facebook? They're not paying for Facebook. Some people say, like, well, I'm paying for my data. Um, so is that paying for Facebook? No, it's not paying for Facebook. Facebook is free. The data is expensive. Um, uh, and then I ask them, so how is it that Facebook is such a rich company? Um, and people don't know this uh, in those circles, and I think sometimes in our circles also um, people don't know this necessarily, but I think that from my perspective, from an impact perspective, also from a responsibility perspective, you know, we're bringing digitization for the first time to these places. We need to also do it in a way responsibly. And I think that one of the really important um, things that blockchain can really bring is this concept of data sovereignty, but not only in, you know, higher level internet of internets kind of um, concept, but also like basic data that is now for the first time being digitized, how can we responsibly do it in a way where people actually have control over what they have? I'm actually very interested to hear about the stuff that you're working on as well about this, but you know, like and the stuff that Chang was saying as well, like to have your own data to be able to control it. And I think that um, right now, if we actually look, sorry to bring it to, to the continent of Africa all the time, but um, Right now, there are people, there are organizations outside of Africa that are paying money to get data of people, um, many, sometimes uh, not depersonalized, so like actual data um, is flowing to people and they're paying for it and someone's getting the money, but these people have no control over their own data. And that's um, something that blockchains can do really easily. And not only can they stop the, that extractive behavior, but also can empower the people who are able to um, put their data onto uh, a ledger uh, to be able to get money, maybe money back for it or be able to at least have consent to what their, their data is being used for. And I think from my perspective, that's a really interesting um, use as far as blockchains and it, where, it go, where it might go into the future. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious for you three, right? Again, you're, again, you're talking about healthcare. We're talking about records management, artists and NFTs. Um, actually, quickly, uh, remember, slido.com. You're going to get a prompt, put in VEF, make sure you, and you add your question. There'll be people who will leave tonight and they'll go, they didn't answer the question that I wanted to hear. That's because you didn't put it in the Slido. So put it in the Slido. Um, but what are some of the, I, I don't know, I'm going to put it this way, killer apps or the use cases that you think are going to onboard the most people onto blockchains, right? 
I mean, healthcare is, is massive, that makes sense. Like records management also is massive. Um, seems like NFTs are the biggest thing right now, right? Some people say, you know, Dapper Labs through like Topshop and whatever has onboarded more people on, on the blockchain in a way or Web3 than anyone else. I don't know if that's true, right? But um, what, what do you think are the, again, I'll just call them killer apps that will actually get people using blockchain, again, whether it's in healthcare or in art and culture? Well, I think it's going to be, I mean, I, I'm, I'm guessing when you say onboard people, I, I'm, talk, I, I'm assuming you mean like at a consumer level, right? Yeah. Like, for yeah. example, if you're storing everybody's health data on the blockchain, nobody, if they're not using it, nobody's really onboarded, right? So I'm, I'm assuming we're talking about consumer applications. I actually think NFTs have a shot uh, at being the killer consumer application. I mean, that's kind of why we're, we're involved in the space. Um, right now, the concept of NFTs is really... Um, these, these static assets. Uh, I, I think that these NFTs end up being building blocks that become much more dynamic, that change state, that, uh, that can be al almost like games in, in and of itself. And obviously gaming is a, a huge industry. I, I think one of the biggest barriers right now is that you know, the concept of NFTs and crypto, and all that, it just has a bad rap. There are a, a crap ton of scams out there and, and people will get rugged. And if anybody knows what... Uh, the term, if anybody doesn't know what the term rugged is, rugged is like when you get scammed. Um, it's just a really, it, like just like the early internet days, we're just super early in the space. And it's, it's almost an uphill battle to convince somebody that what you're building on the blockchain uh, or in NFTs is legitimate and not you know, trying to scam them out of money. Um, I think getting over that barrier is what's, what's going to be important. And I think what it's going to take is some of these NFTs and, and, and some of these products to start providing value to the people who are already willing to accept it and for that, for everybody else to see what that value is. That's kind of why for us, we're really encouraged by these, these independent creators, these artists that are using NFTs to build their community, build their network um, that's observable by other fans that are not necessarily involved in the crypto space, right? Um, we see it kind of as more of a natural growth strategy rather than trying to force blockchain technology onto consumers in general. I, I don't think that'll work. Well, I actually really like your answer. Again, you talked about, again, NFTs being a big opportunity, opportunity, but you also talked about the barriers, right? And maybe that's how you guys might want to answer the question, actually, which is like, what do you think the biggest opportunity is, right? And what's holding that back? I don't know if you want to go, Nico. Like the biggest opportunity for blockchain, you mean? Yeah. Um, I don't actually know how to answer that question. I, I, I wonder whether we've realized what the opportunity is. Like, if we, I think something that you were bringing up just right before this was just like early days of internet, no one really knew what, what, is it, what it was going to do. I was young when the internet started, um, but no one imagined Amazon or me being able to use a smartphone to open my garage door, but like I guarantee you no one was thinking about that. We're, we're still GeoCities, not even, even pre-GeoCities pre days. If anybody's old enough to remember what GeoCities was, it's, yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty young and I, I get it. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so I wonder whether we've realized this actually, what, what, whether, we've, whether it's out there yet or not. Um, uh, but I think in the end, uh, you know, there's, there, it, it will probably be something about decentralization and the ability of people to, to kind of manage their own um, uh, fates, their own digital fates, maybe. Um, yeah, I don't have much oh, more to say about that. There is one other thing I think is really interesting, right? Like the, the concept of the blockchain is that the data is out in the open, it's shareable, at least public blockchains. And uh, I think what you're going to see that's going to capture people's attention is the concept of composability. So taking data and assets and NFTs from one ecosystem and using it in another. Uh, from a consumer growth perspective, this becomes exciting when one of your favorite brands or one of your favorite creators or one of your favorite artists does a collaboration with somebody else. It kind of brings that audience over to yet another audience, it allows that, that consumer base to intermingle. I think that that interaction mechanism will probably help spur a new type of uh, a growth. Fantastic. And Victoria, you must have people coming to UBC and just asking you plainly, right, from different industries, whether it's, you know, pharmaceuticals or healthcare or accounting or, or finance. And 
I'm sure they're just asking you the question, right? Like, what, what can we do with this and why should we pay attention, right? So just to bring it back to, right, like, what is the actual use case that, again, you think, again, is either going to touch the most people or, or the most, like, industries? Like, how, how do you think about that at UBC? Yeah, well, it, I mean, we, we think about it as, you know, what kind of problems can you solve with, with a ledger, right? And, you know, I go back to this idea of record, records management. Records management pervades everything, right? We create records for just about everything. So anything you could imagine needing to create a record of, like your identity, for example, your passport, or, you know, supply chains, or tracing, you know, where do minerals or forestry projects come from, or your medical records, it, it's, it's so pervasive. So you can, I mean, all of these are potential use cases. So what's really, we're in this enormous period of, you know, exploding creativity where we're experimenting with this emerging technology. And it's really, it is really early days. And it's, it's, it's super exciting. So yeah, we have all kinds of industry partners coming to us about, well, I have this idea. You know, what do I need to do to think through this idea? Uh, you know, what's the right blockchain to choose for this? What are, what are some of the barriers to adoption? You know, how do I create a, a, a business strategy out of this? These are the kinds of research problems that we're working with industry partners on. And we have, you know, professors at blockchain at UBC that, that come from finance or engineering or computer science or archival science, like I do. And we all have our particular areas of expertise and we can work collectively to, you know, help industry partners think it through as they're working on, you know, what, what is the, the next big killer app? But I do think, you know, myself, we're, we're seeing a lot in um, digital identity. So self-sovereignty, that's, you know, particularly one thing that I've been working on for all the ethical reasons, too, that, that Nico mentioned. You know, I really think that as we start to build out this technology, we, if you, if you go back to kind of the spirit of Bitcoin, it was really about, you know, the financial institutions and, you know, the, the 1% versus the 99%. So we can rebuild um, architectures that kind of replicate those, those distortions, those uh, inequities, or we can really try and think through how can we build a better world with this technology. So I would really like us to think about that as we're working on our our solutions to think, you know, what kind of world am I building with this technology? So that that's a lot of where my work lands, you know, uh, thinking about those those issues and trying to make it fairer, uh, trying to kind of flatten, um, you know, fewer unicorns and, and more, you know, distributed wealth, which I think is more sustainable overall. So, but you know, um, to each his own, I guess. But but those are the ethics that I try to bring to all my projects. Fantastic, thank you. And I think I'm supposed to be doing Q&A soon. So one last reminder, I got another question for you guys. Slido.com, hashtag is VEF, then you can answer questions or ask questions. But um, we're talking about, again, all these grand plans and visions and blockchain and the opportunities. But in order to do all of that, obviously you need people, you need talent, right? Uh, you need uh, capital, perhaps. You need networks and relationships. So I'm really curious uh, on, on two levels, just sort of a global level, like, um, like wh where are you looking for, for blockchain talent and expertise or where are you seeing where there's a concentration of that beyond Vancouver, right? And then I'm curious, like locally, um, when you look at talent, when you look at capital and, and sort of networks and, and, and resources, like, I don't know, how do you rate Vancouver as an ecosystem? And are there other people you would want to, I don't know, shout out or, or point to? We had some really great, really great uh, lightning pitches, right? So we saw some interesting folks there. Um, but what else is happening in Vancouver? So, so two things, which is where are you seeing the biggest concentration of blockchain, talent, capital, resources? And then sort of how do you look at Vancouver sort of in the global blockchain space? I mean, Wilkins, I don't know if you want to kick us off. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about it. Um, to be honest, I'm not looking, like when, when I think about blockchain technology, we're so new in the space. I don't know how many specific blockchain developers or engineers or product people there really are, right? Uh, our perspective is like we're just looking for really smart developers, engineers, product people um, that are just good and, and excited about blockchain technology and what it can do, right? Um, 
when we think about talent, I think COVID has really shown that you know, the, the talent pool is really global. So we actually, our team is actually everywhere. Um, a lot of them in the US, a lot of them in Canada. Our approach, we have the luxury to essentially pay everybody the same, regardless of where they work. Um, I guess our perspective there is like, if you're doing the same work, you should be getting compensated the same anyways. Um, not everybody has the ability to do that, but I guess like if you do, I would highly encourage you to treat people like really they, they have the ability to be mobile. They have the ability to be anywhere else. And this isn't just a blockchain specific thing. I think this is a technical specific thing. Um, if you don't think like that, especially on the technical side, people can really do their job anywhere. And I think it's gonna be really hard to compete for talent if you don't approach it like that. One of the other interesting dynamics of blockchain is that you know, as a blockchain or, or blockchain developer, the incentive structures are really different now. Like for example, like if you're trying to hire people to do uh, work with you to build out an NFT ecosystem, it's like, well, why do I wanna work for you when I can just go do an NFT drop and, and be my own artist and make, make your own money? So I think people have to get more and more used to the idea that people will have their own side projects. And you know, for us, we actually encourage that. Like, all, our, our, all the people that we work with, we encourage them to build their own side projects because it helps them bring experience back into their, their core job, and they've been quite successful at it, right? Um, I think that expectation that everything you do uh, when, you're, when you're working on the technology you're passionate about belongs to a company, I think that's in the past. I think you need to acknowledge the fact that people, the best people will work on side projects and you wanna actually encourage that. So that's a, a very, atypical, I guess, viewpoint of, of stuff, but I really think that both in, in terms of blockchain developers, because it's so limited, and the technology sector in general, I believe that the companies that will grow the fastest and win and attract the best talent will probably take that perspective. Fantastic. I, I've also found that actually academic institutions tend to have a higher concentration of blockchain experts uh, than what I can find in the random population of developers. Um, that's just been, I don't know if that's actually real, but that's the kind of how I've found it. Like most people who I'm able to have uh, a conversation that continues uh, about something substantial tend to be from academic institutions. So I think that's interesting. Um, also Montreal seems to have a lot of people. Um, again, just my own um, single uh, viewpoint. But Great city. Yeah, true. Um, so that's, that's, that would be my answer to that, yeah. What about you, Victoria? Well, I, I hope I hope academic institutions have a higher concentration. You, you've been hoarding everyone. That's what. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. No, what what I'm doing is I'm producing them. So our job is to actually create the talent, right? So we take like raw material uh, in the form of young students that come to us, and we actually train them and teach them about blockchains and um, you know how to develop using. Uh, different blockchain protocols and you know different perspectives on how you design blockchain solutions. So that that's really what we do. It's one of the core things that we produce. Our, our output is people, and I'm really happy to say that you know we're getting really good results. Um, I just uh, finished one of my masters in um, software engineering students. He's now just joined one of our industry partners. Another one of my students two years ago, she uh, was hired by the industry partner she worked with. So what we're finding is that industry partners that come to us and do internships with the students are finding they like those students and they're hiring them, which is great. I mean, that shows that we're doing the right thing. And then other of us, our students have gone off to uh, one guy, PhD in engineering. He's now working for a, um, uh, a venture, a hedge fund in the crypto space, so. Uh, I just want to, I find that pretty encouraging because, you know, the last kind of technology wave was mobile, right? And I think when we were, like the last company I had, we were pr really early in mobile. And one of the biggest problems was like lack of talent because it's just such a new technology. And I remember, you know, talking to people at UBC, the process at UBC and stuff like that. Um, they were really hesitant to introduce you know, mobile technology and mobile development into the course. So it's, it's really encouraging that, I guess right, right now, you guys are actually incorporating that into the course stream. So Yeah, that, yeah that we're, we're doing that, absolutely. And we, we started off, you know, um, well, you know, I, I have a kind of a label as a hackademic because, you know, here I am an archival scientist and I had computer scientists calling me up when I first founded blockchain at UBC. It was like, 
what is this blockchain? Is it a thing? And, um, you know, you're, you're kind of, you have to push against uh, the entrenched view and say, no, this is, we really need to posi position ourselves. This is a thing and it's going to be huge. We're not even, you know, this is, we're still at the very beginning. And um, yeah, so it, it, it really was seeing an opportunity for the university to fill that gap, which I knew was coming. Fantastic. All right, now I think I'm officially past the time. So I think we're going to get the questions up on the screen. Is that right? We're getting a head nod. Oh, all right, here we are. I'm going to need my glasses. Oh, that's interesting. Um, okay, so the first one's about the fact that the world is currently ending. Um, how have the last few weeks in the crypto space impacted your approach for the future? Is it just noise? Yeah, it's not. I mean, like, it's, it happens, right? Like, it's still early market. It's still super volatile. I mean, if anybody dug into Terra Luna, right? Like, I mean, come on, right? Uh, but, yeah, I mean, there is obviously market sentiment, but I don't think it's really crypto-specific. If you take a look at the global macroeconomic situation, it's not really positive either, so I don't think it's isolated to crypto. Crypto just had a story, right? Um, yeah. Also, uh, I think this also is a, one of the barriers to blockchain uh, adoption, which is the identification of blockchain as crypto. Um, when like, and, and you know, like you go and you tell someone it's a blockchain and they, they're assuming crypto and they're assuming um, that, you know, that you're kind of linked to these kind of things. I think, um, so from our perspective, this is just, uh, as you were saying, it's like a, a larger symptom of a larger thing. And for us, for example, as a company, um, larger economic uh, downfall. I, I mean, have you guys seen Netflix stock? I mean, come on, right? <laughs> exactly. Well, so um, that's Shopify what I was saying. Shopify is down 70%. Yeah, I don't want to talk about Shopify. It's like, I, I like Shopify long term. Shopify, massive plus plus, but like, yeah, it's not. Yeah. So like, honestly, <laughs> what, like block, blockchain, crypto, it's like whatever, right? Yeah, so crypto agnostic, I think, as a company who just finished a round, all our investors are saying, um, make sure that any extra that you oversubscribed is to prolong the runway, um, not to spend more aggressively because this is, you know, I think this is more of a symptom of, of um, you know, correlated assets going down and all these things rather than, than crypto itself. We haven't been affected because we're not a crypto company, but yeah. Great. Do you yeah. have anything to add? Holding all the way in my dark triad psychopathy, a <laughs> little Bitcoin joke for y'all. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you guys heard about that. You know, all Bitcoiners are dark triad psychopaths. Uh, that was, was apparently nope. a, are you, are you, a thing. Are you a Bitcoin maxi? <laughs> <laughs> I'm holding, let's just say, but a lot of the research that I do is, has got nothing to do with cryptocurrencies, um, and it has to do with cybersecurity type applications. So similarly, records management, it's, uh, so it's just kind of like whatever, the markets can do what they like, but yeah. Cool, thank you. Uh, this one's a really interesting one, devil's advocate, advocate dot, dot, dot. Is trusting smart contracts instead of people a good idea? Smart contract bugs can have significant consequences depending on the application. Um, Wilkins, do you want to tackle that one first? I, I mean, yep. <laughs> I mean, like, I mean, like, yeah. Smart contract bugs can have significant issues. I mean, if you're doing something of significance, you want to get checked, double checked. You want to get audited. You know, an example is like there was a recent NFT drop had a bug in their contract, and $35 million is just locked in that contract forever, right? So, yeah, like, it, it's, the other beautiful thing about the blockchain is, is yeah, rule, code is law, right? So that, co that $35 million is locked because, you know, it, it functioned as intended. So the question is, you know, if you're doing something important, you know, it is truly immutable, right? You can obviously build in escape hatches and stuff like that, uh, but I would say that I would trust, you know, the rule of code over somebody saying something, I guess. Uh, yeah. I mean, if you, if you do a private blockchain, obviously you can put in rules and, and, and algorithms and, and tools to 
reverse out transactions that are important in private blockchain. So if, if you're dealing in private space, I think you're a lot more safer. But in the public space, you are playing the public. The data is public. Uh, just make sure your, your smart contract code is well audited and well tested. And that's really the only advice I can give. Depends if you trust who's behind your blockchain. I mean, you know, that seriously, I mean, there's, there's times when that, that kind of centralized control is, is legit and, and it, it, you know, you can, you can um, justify it. But there's other times, like let's say um, your, uh, your central bank digital currency or your passport, uh, where we might want some controls on just having a, you know, a rug pull situation. Um, yeah, so lots of things to think through. I'm a cybersecurity expert as well as an archival scientist, so I will always say the devil's in the detail as well as how you implement it. So if you really write insecure code or your architecture is insecure, you don't do basic cybersecurity like the Axie Infinity hack recently of their bridge, um, you're going to run into problems. Great, thank you. So the next one's really interesting because I think there's probably some explaining to do here. Um, how is the energy need and the data need for using blockchain being addressed in African countries as both are super expensive in most African nations? Um, I feel like there's a lot of explanation probably that's needed um, to answer that. Well, maybe not, actually. Um, so I'm actually not an expert on blockchain outside of our own blockchain, I'll tell you that. Um, but uh, the reality is that uh, energy is very expensive in, in Africa. Um, it's mostly oil-based. Um, and um, the um, normal uh, blockchains are not actually, like when I say normal, I mean like um, uh, energy-intensive ones are not actually used that much uh, from my own uh, experience and understanding there. Um, so that's exactly why we actually had to design a, 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 a blockchain that's the opposite of energy consuming and yep. demanding of high, um, high uh, data needs. Yeah. So again, it, it depends, right? Again, you have your own blockchain. So you've, yours is like purpose built. Yes. It's like almost like an ASIC, I guess. That is it. But, so comments on Luna Collapse. I mean, I don't, I don't know if we really, we could probably skip that one. I don't know if you guys have comments on Luna Collapse. Um, what else is on here? What's there to say? I mean, what's, what's there to say? <laughs> what's there to say? If anybody dug into it, it's like, yeah, obviously, right? <laughs> so. Um, the next one's interesting. Nico, is the value prop of signalytic approach unique to developing countries? Is your solution applicable to first world drug supply chains? That's interesting. Uh, short answer is yes, it's applicable. Uh, the thing is, though, our technology is not just a blockchain. It's actually a stack of technologies. Um, and when we were actually talking to... Uh, Actually, up until this year, our clients in Africa, um, a lot of them didn't actually know we were running a blockchain. We were just trying to kind of just show that stuff works as it works. Um, uh, so uh, the asynchronous part of the updating uh, is not necessarily um, locked to Africa. There's actually, um, we think there might be use cases in rural areas, for example, in Canada, in our northern communities here. Um, and I think the you know the ability to like bridge the infrastructure gap plus uh, make uh, you know data accessible and, and have the people who are creating the data be sovereign over it. I think it's applicable here. I think one thing that we need to do whenever we do come into um, let's say Canada is exercise the same amount of respect that we exercised um, for um, our end users in Uganda and make sure that um, we are providing something that they do need and something that makes them feel comfortable, etc. Um, so. Um, I think short answer is yes, we can. Uh, long answer is um, there's probably other ways to do it that it doesn't have to be as complicated as we made it. Yeah, yeah that's fantastic. Um, we're over time again, so let's see if we can do some questions really, really fast. Um, so the first question, uh, no, Wilkins doesn't run, run fuck render. Um, a guy named Frederick does, I've, I've met him. Wilkins has his own Twitter, um, so that's a funny one. Um, we answered that one. How do you explain to a person why they need a decentralized YouTube when we have a Web2 YouTube, which is already so good? Is YouTube so good? But, sorry. Um, uh, I mean, here's a quick answer no, to that. I mean, I mean, forget about YouTube, right? Like, it's just content in general, yeah. right? Like, when you share content on these, these centralized networks, the problem is that you don't control the audience, right? Like, you, you have no tie 
to the people that are engaging with your content at all, right? And I think that's one of the really powerful things about Web3. You end up being able to control and build your own ecosystem with direct ways to interact and access them, right? Um, you also give the ability for other people to interact with that community as well. So I think that's, that's one of the really critical things. You don't own your data on YouTube. You don't own the audience. You know, it's a big problem. You don't own the records. Like yeah, from a records perspective also, um, we're looking at it in, in a war crime situation. You don't control whether that evidence stays there or what people do with it, whether they manipulate the evidence or not. So with a decentralized system, you have much better control. Great, let's try, and, let's try and do three more here. So any comments about using blockchain in supply chain management, such as food safety? Yeah, I think, I, well, I, I've thought about this space as, as well. It's like, I think it's, it's a great solution if you can incentivize the participants properly. Exactly, I think blockchain, like the data that goes in is what we're all dependent on and finding it, like also in agriculture, for example, um, how do you actually get to the digitization of data and, you, and how do you actually uh, make everyone confident that the data that, w that went in matters, uh, or not that matters, that, that is actually uh, verifiable and true. Um, I don't know if we've come up actually with the best way to, to do that. I, I don't think so either, but like, I, I think like conceptually speaking, it's like anybody can inject data on the blockchain. It, it doesn't really matter. Like anybody could do it. It's whether or not that data is sane is what's important, mm -hmm. right? And, and I think someone could come up with a really good supply chain solution if they can incentivize the validator participants properly, right? And I think it, would, it could be pretty powerful. It's just who, who's, who's the entity who, or who are the, who are the consortium of partners that want to do it? Um, it might actually come from industry. Great, all right, let's, um, definitely over now. So I'm gonna be selfish and ask the last question up there that I want to. So how do we balance personal privacy with the need to publicly verify transactions? Who wants to take that on? And then I've got three more questions for you guys and then I think we'll have to wrap it up. I mean, data privacy and publicly verifiable data they're related, they're tangential, right? Like for example, you can actually write transactions to the chain. You could just store transaction hashes, right? And that essentially, like, and then you can keep the data completely separate, right? Like the data doesn't actually have to be on chain just as long as, as a verifiable receipt or a verifiable hash or a verifiable compressed structure that you can actually decode is on chain. Right, like so that were so I, I agree with you in most use cases, but in healthcare use cases, sure. the very fact that you know your interaction is is hashed on chain can leak data about you. Like, sure. oh, I'm participating in this study, and this is a you know a, a healthcare um, a mental health study that indicates that I'm you know having some kind of a challenge you know that way, which could be something that I didn't want people to know or. You know, so so I think there's certain use cases where it's it's perfectly fine. You have to really think about what are the specific requirements for your use case. How much transaction privacy, source privacy, do you need for different use cases? So, for example, the blockchain solution that I built, it doesn't record anything on the on a blockchain. It uses a blockchain to set up a secure communication channel between two peers and they talk to each other and nobody knows their business. Yeah, I also want to note there are privacy chains that, that exist out there where you can't really trace who did what, but you There's can trace it. There's a difference it. between data, what I call data content privacy and source, transaction source privacy. Those are good for source transaction privacy, not so much for the confidentiality of the content of the transactions. Finally, I got a debate going. <laughs> uh, just, uh, just kidding. All right, is there anyone in the audience who says, like, I really wanted my question answered, they didn't answer it, it didn't get up here, and is brave enough to, to ask a question? No one is brave enough. Heath versus Sol Solana? <laughs> we didn't respond to that. <laughs> Do you want to respond to that? Sure, sure. Okay, so here's the thing. I'm not going to tell you whether to buy ETH versus Solana, but here's a theory. It's just a theory. So blockchain, we talk about it as being a technology, but really the way that we like to think of it is block, at blockchain at UBC is a socio-informational technical system. It's actually, it's, it's a community as much as a technology. 
So around these blockchain protocols, there are communities that form. So when you're looking at what should I buy into, definitely one of the things I think you should look at is how active is the community? I think you got at this a little bit, like where's your audience, right? So if you're building an NFT project, like how active is the audience in that protocol? And that's where you'll see you know, the, the value generated a lot. Now, right now we're in like a, an asset class correlation. So like tech stocks and, and different cryptocurrencies, they're all correlating with each other. Um, but you know, when, when we get out of this, you'll see things start to, to, you know, to vary a little bit more. But that's one of the key things I think you should look at, community. Fantastic, and anything first. to add before we wrap it up, guys? Go all Victoria, Nico, Wilkins, thanks so much for all your insights this evening. Thank you guys for the questions. I think we need to get off the stage now and, and welcome Tony back. But once again, thanks all. Let's give our, our panel a round of applause. Thanks, guys. That was uh, really interesting. And thanks for joining us tonight. Awesome stuff. Uh, just a reminder, we do a survey at the end of each event just to help us improve. So look out for that in your email. and. Please give us your feedback. Uh, and then uh, the next event is the final event for the season uh, next month. Uh, and it, it is the event called The Future of Transportation. Uh, it's uh, taking place at the Vancouver Convention Center. And our speakers uh, or our panelists so far, or our panelists are uh, Sandra Phillips, uh, a shared mobility architect, TED Talk speaker, and CEO of MoveMe. Jay Gerard, CEO of Damon Motors, which is launching, launching the world's fastest electric motorbike. And J.R. Hammond, Executive Director of Canadian Air Mobility. Uh, Simon Pickup, former CEO of Hydra Energy. And we also have a speaker from the luxury electric car company, Lucid Motors. Uh, this event uh, will have an intera interactive component to it, so please join us and be involved. And we'll be showcasing some technology there as well that we can hopefully touch and feel. Uh, so registration is open. Uh, please sign up for that event at the Convention Center. And special thanks to CBRE uh, and Damon Motors, who are sponsors of that event next month, and Healy Thurwell from CR CBRE for helping put together that event and leading on that. And for those of you who are online, thanks for joining us tonight. For those of you here, please uh, interact with our panelists and have a chat, and uh, look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Thank you.